Well, welcome again, everybody. Thanks for that. We dusted off that old song. Guys, I looked it up. It was 1995 when Grace came out with that song. Awesome. Bethany's laughing. She was only a few years old. <laughs> uh, but no, that's what we're talking about today. God loves people more than anything. Talked about it last week uh, in serving. Talked about it this week. And uh, it's the fact that why am I popping? Am I too close? Okay. All right. So last week we uh, talked about uh, serving. This week we're going to talk about something uh, something else. But I want to do a little bit of review, right? Uh, so what happens at the first of every year? Everybody starts making these New Year's resolutions, right? I guarantee you some of you, you're... Uh -huh. Some of you are... Uh, you're, you're a month in and you've already, like, blown them off, right? Um, but we do that at the first of the year. Right? We kind of we want to make these New Year's resolutions, and we want to change, and we want to do something better. Whether it's I want to do more reading, I'm going to do take get better care of myself physically, I'm going to travel more, whatever that is. We do that at the first of the year, right? Um, and so Shannon has been leading us through a series called "Becoming the Me I Ought to Be," right? At the first of the year, uh, and as we walked through this, and we're going to walk through the, kind of the first few weeks. It's kind of more about becoming the me that God wants me to be, right? Because that's the best me I'm going to be. You know, that is the best me I'm going to be um, is uh, who God wants me to be. Um, oh, I'm going to go one more. There we go. Um, and we talked about a resolution, right? These New Year's resolutions. Uh, and we talked about the fact that that's making a firm decision to do or not do something. Now, if you've already blown your resolution, you probably didn't make a firm decision to do that. Um, but that's kind of how we're defining the New Year's resolution, a firm decision to do or not to do something. Uh, and so the thing that we want to do in this year, 2020, is become the best me that I ought to be. Um, and we, first week, we talked about the Bible. Uh, and we, if, you, you, if you've been around uh, for a few weeks now, you kind of see what are we doing, right? We're walking through... The spiritual disciplines of the faith, right? In the first week, we talked about the Bible and the fact that the Bible has good information on how to be a better me. Um, and we talked about that we've got to spend time in God's Word, right? Every day, you got to be there. You got to be there. You got to be in God's Word. Uh, give it the opportunity. It's the only book, guys, that you can read that the author's present with you. It's the only book that you can read. The Holy Spirit is right there. What's he doing? He's teaching, he's rebuking, he's correcting, he's training um, for us to be the best being we can be. We talked about uh, U-version apps that you can use. We talked about soap. Um, and it's not scrubbing yourself down, right? It's a way that you can analyze through, uh, through the Bible. You've got scripture and read it. You're going to observe it. You're going to apply it. You're going to have your prayer time. Uh, Blue Letter Bible, we talked about that. And you've got the sermon notes, right? Shannon is really great about having sermon notes for us. And go back and read those. Uh, through the week, let God speak to you through that. Uh, use His Word. Uh, and then the second week, we talked about prayer. And what does prayer do? Prayer aligns our will with God's. Prayer aligns our will with God's will. Um, we talked about the fact that we should always be in a continual attitude of prayer. Now, does that mean I'm walking around like this all day? No. It means that all the time, I'm looking, I'm in a, I'm in a spirit of prayer with God, with what's going on around me. Uh, I'm always doing that. God's going to listen. He said in His Word, if you come before me, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen. Uh, the disciples, you know, the disciples we talked about could have asked Jesus for anything. They could have asked him to teach them anything in the world. God, teach me how you can do those miracles. Teach me how you can turn uh, that water into wine. Teach me how you can feed all those people with that little bit of fish and that little bit of bread. But what did they do? They said, God, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Why? How many times do we see in God's word, he's going off and he's praying. And you could just, you got to know that when he comes back from that, as Shannon was saying, there's something different about Christ. You, they could see it in his countenance, in the power that he has after that. Um, so you got to think, that's probably why when they could ask him for anything, they said, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Um, because there's power there. 
And then we talked about giving. Talked about giving invites God to invest in me. Uh, living generously is not about so much about what God wants from me, but it's more about what He wants um, from I mean for us. And now the fact that He multiplies everything we give. When we give of our time, when we give of our resources, when we give of our talents, He just multiplies it. He keeps multiplying it. He keeps multiplying it. Uh, and we talked about the fact that, that there, he, gives, he pours into us thanksgiving. Right? When we give generously, we, we're going to do that with a thankful heart. I mean, just look and say, God, thank you that I'm able to provide. For you blessed me that I'm able to provide. I'm able to give. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm able to give. Um, and the person that you're giving to, man, they get to do the same thing. Thank you for allowing this person to pour into me. Um, what else does he pour into us when we're living generously with contentment? Right? The more we give and the more God provides, and the more we give and the more God provides, we kind of finally figure it out. God, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I just need to keep being a conduit. I just need to let you keep giving and giving and giving through me. Um, and in a loving heart, right? It allows us to focus on somebody else. Right? When we live generously, when we give, we're focusing on somebody else. Um, and that's what God's pouring into us as well. Serving. So we talked about last week. Serving breaks the control of selfishness in our lives. Breaks the control of selfishness in our lives. And what do we talk about? You see a need, you meet the need. Right? Look through God's eyes. You see a need, you're going to meet that need. Uh, serving is love in action. And we unpacked that in small group the other night. We talked about what does that look like? You know, what does it look like to serve, right? Um, you know, if, you, if you look up one of the best definitions of love I've ever seen is sacrificing to meet the real needs of somebody else. Sacrificing to meet the real needs <clears throat> of somebody else. Um, and we talked about what does that look like in our home? What does it look like if I serve my spouse? What does it look like if I serve my kids? What does it look like if I serve those people I work with? Um, or those people that I play ball with? Or those people that I come into contact with just around in the community? Whatever that looks like. Um, and it's a call to get to the back of the line. Right? It's a call to get to the back of the line. Put other people first. Um, and then today, we're going to talk about sharing. Sharing our faith. Um, and man, I know many of you just went, Ooh, that makes me nervous. Damn, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I don't know what I'm doing. It's okay, we're going to talk about that. Relax. It's all right. Um, but no, it, it, but all of this that we talked about, these five disciplines, including the one today, it's all about balance. It's all about balance. Um, this is not a buffet that you just kind of pick Bible and prayer and that's all I want. And leave out giving and leave out serving and leave out sharing. You know, it's it's not a buffet. It's about balance, right? Somebody should put, we should have a beatitude. It says, blessed are the balanced. Um, because they can become the, be, the best me they ought to be, right? We should put that one in there. Um, but now if you think about it, even in the Olympics, right? You've got, a, you've got an Olympic... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Absolutely. Sport. This is the pentathlon, right? And the pentathlon is five different sports. Uh, you got shooting, fencing, horseback riding, running, swimming. You can't be good at one or two of those and be successful. You're going to lose. You got to be balanced. You have to do them all well. Um, and that's what we're looking at today. Um, and, and we should do a checkup, right? I would, I would encourage you to do a checkup in your life every so often. The Bible encourages us to test ourselves, examine ourselves, reorder some things in our lives if we need to, to make sure that we're in balance, that we're taking care of all five of these things. Um, and then the ones that Shannon's going to talk about next week as well. Um, so why we share? Why share? Why do I need to share God's Word. Why do I need to do that? Um, well, you can see in, in, in your notes there, there's a couple of verses. 
And the first one is John 17, 18, and that says, in, in the same way, this is Jesus talking, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I'm giving these people a mission in the world. And Acts 24, 20, 24 says the most important thing that you can do is complete that mission. The work that the Lord Jesus gave me. I've got a mission in the world, and the most important thing I can do is complete that. Sharing the love of Christ. Ever what that looks like. Um, God is at work all around us. And He's just inviting us to be a part of that. He's working in people's lives all around you. And if you just ask Him, God, open my eyes, then I can see that. Let me be a part of that. Let me just jump in and see where you're working and see where you're blessing. And let me be a part of that. Just let me jump in and see it. Um, so last week we talked about a ministry to the body, right? Serving. This week we're talking about a mission to the world, to those around us. Um, Jesus understood his mission. Uh, Twelve years old, he kind of gotten lost and gotten away from his parents and found him. And what did he say? He said, did you not know that i got to be about my father's business? Twelve years old. Twenty-one years later, thirty-three years old. He's dying on a cross, and he said, it's finished. My work's done. Uh, two statements. I mean, what a well-bookend life, right? What a well-bookend life. So Jesus' mission, right, he had a mission when he was here from physically, in his physical body, and the mission has continued today, guess what, through us? Because we're the spiritual body of Christ. So we've got to continue that same mission that he's doing. What is, what is the mission that Christ had? 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, All this is from God. <clears throat> Lose my voice. He reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is all about reconciling the lost world. That's all he wants. That's all he wants. It's a lost world to be reconciled to him and he wants us to be a part of that. Um, redeemed, he redeemed us from Satan and he reconciled us to himself. Why? So that we can become the me, best me we ought to be. And part of that is helping him serve and sharing. So, why is sharing so important? We've already noted that it's a continuation of Christ's ministry while he was here. Look, Romans. Me back up one. It's a continuation of Christ's ministry while he was here. Um, he reconciled us to him, and he told us to go for it. Um, I put down five scriptures that you could just... It, it, this was very important to Christ. He said it at least five times. Um, it's like, guys, I really want you to get this. I really want you to get this. Matthew 20, 19, and 20, what did he say? Go make disciples. And teach them to obey. Mark 16, 15. He said, go to the world and preach the good news. Go and preach the good news. Luke 24, 27. Preach repentance and forgiveness to all the nations. And it starts right around us. John 20, 21. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. In Acts 1, a very familiar passage says power. Um, we have the power of the Holy Spirit when He comes on us and we will be witnesses. And I'm going to paraphrase. Witnesses in Indian land and in South Carolina and the United States and the world. Um, and guys, the commissions aren't optional. They're not optional. To not do that, to not share... Is living a life of disobedience. And I'm going to tell you, that hit me this week. Because, you know, Shannon will tell you, Mike will tell you, when you prepare for these things, you guys just get it today. I get it all week long. Um, but, I mean, that was like, damn. You're living in disobedience sometimes, son. you got to be sharing with other people about the love. That I am. We just sang about it. God loves people. 
more than anything. And more than anything, he wants him to know he'd rather die than let him go. That hit me this week. And it's like, Kim, you got to step up your game, dude. Do I do that? Yeah. Do I do it as often as I should? No. No. Um, and I was reading this week, God may very well hold us accountable for that, guys. And Ezekiel, prophet Ezekiel 3.18 says, Ezekiel warned them so that they will live. If you don't, and they die not me, I'm going to hold you accountable. Ouch. If they die without knowing me, I'm going to hold you accountable. Man, that's tough. That's tough. So not only is our mission, um, not only is, is our sharing to continue a mission that Christ so, but man, it's a wonderful privilege. It's an absolute privilege. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the recon ministry of reconciliation as we've already said. Listen to what the Living Bible says. you got to be careful with paraphrases, but this is a good one. God has given me the privilege of urging people to come to him and to be reconciled to him. Let me say that again. God has given you the privilege of urging everybody to come to Him and to be reconciled to Him. I mean, we get the privilege to work with God, to represent Him. What did Paul say? Paul says we're co-laborers with Christ. Think about it, guys. What's He done? He's secured our salvation. He's adopted us into his family. He's given us his Holy Spirit and that power that lives within us. And he's given us the privilege of being represented to him. Are you kidding me? That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. So what else? Not only are we continuing the mission, not only is it a privilege... But guys, telling others how to experience eternal life is the very best thing that you can do for them. Nothing else even compares. Doesn't even come close. Uh, I mean, think about it. You, if you had the cure for cancer and you didn't share that, not so good. If you had the cure for the common cold and you didn't share that, not so good. I mean, we, we've got the secret for forgiveness, for purpose, for peace, for eternal life. And I think sometimes we just don't share because we forget how hopeless we were without Christ. Especially those that have been going at this Christian life for a long time. We forget. We forget how hopeless our life was without Him. Remember when you're looking at people, guys, it doesn't matter how contented they look. It doesn't matter how successful they appear. Without Christ, they are hopelessly lost. What's your name again? And they're headed for an eternal separation from God. Acts 4.12 says that the, the, the salvation, the solution for that, is found in nobody else other than Jesus Christ. And you've got to share it. What else? We got to continue his mission. We, we can experience the privilege. We can do, it's the very best thing we can do. And guess what, guys? The message that we have is of eternal significance. It's going to impact somebody's eternal destiny. As we said, there's nothing else that you will ever do that's going to matter that much as helping someone establish an eternal relationship with God. Nothing else you do will matter. We have all eternity to celebrate with those people that we've had the privilege to come alongside of and, and, and bring them to Christ. We've got all eternity to celebrate with them, but we've only got this life to reach them. 
Um, so what do we do? We quit our jobs? Go do this full time? There's people doing that, obviously, but they may not, they may, that may not be where God calls you to be. Might be. Don't fight that. If He wants you to go into full time service, then that's what He wants you to do. Another one for me is we parents. That's what God calls your kid. Guess what? You better not fight that. You better not fight that. Because he may very well call your kid to be in full time service. What else? We continue the mission. We get to experience that privilege. It's the best thing we can do. Our message of eternal significance, but guess what? It gives our life meaning as well. It gives our life meaning. Philosopher William James said, the best use of your life is to spend it for something that's going to outlast you. The best use of your life is to spend it for something that's going to outlast you. Paul said it this way. I consider my life worth nothing if only I may finish the, the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul says I consider it nothing. If I don't do that, I don't consider my life anything. What's Paul saying? If I fail to fulfill my God-given mission here on earth, I may have very well just wasted my life. There's some people, guys, that only you're going to be able to reach at any one point in time. Maybe that's where they are and the Holy Spirit is working with them. If you have an opportunity to reach one person for heaven, if you're the cause that one person gets to go to heaven, your life has made any difference for all eternity. It's easy to get sidetracked, isn't it? Distracted. Right? I can tell you there's nothing that Satan would rather you do than share your faith. I mean, you can be good, you can do all good things, as long as you don't take anybody to heaven with you. Why? Because he wants them to spend an eternity with him in hell, separated from God. In the moment that we get serious about sharing our faith, Guess what? The warfare on your life is going up. The diversions on your life is going up. And yeah, maybe we're going to have to abandon some of our agendas sometimes. Maybe we're going to have to yield some of our rights. Maybe some of our expectations aren't going to be met. Maybe some of the plans that we're going to do, we wanted to do, we're not going to be able to. Because we need to be shared. But if you do, you'll experience God's blessing like you've never had before. Matthew 6.33 says to seek first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is His rule and His reign in life. Seek first the kingdom of God and then all these other things will be added to you. In the context that's written, it's talking about the needs. You know, in other words, if you, if you focus on making the rule and reign of Christ in your life and in somebody else's life, the, mind, the major focus of you, and make it your primary concern, then He's going to provide for everything you need day to day. You don't have to worry. So why don't we share? Why don't we share? I mean, we just talked about five, and there are more. Five great reasons why we need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why don't we? If you ask Christians today, 95 to 97% of them would tell you, yes, I think that Christians should share their faith to somebody else. And 94 to 97% would even tell would even tell you that 
I think that that's the very best thing that can happen to somebody is for them to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But yet, what do statistics tell us? If I look in the last six months, they ask, in the last six months, how many times have you shared your faith with someone about Jesus Christ? So if 94 to 97% of people say that it is the most important thing that can happen in somebody's life is for them to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they ask, in the last six months, have you shared your faith with anybody? 55% of them said nobody. Over half. 24% said I've shared it with one to two in the last six months. 12% said I've shared with three to five. 5% 5 said I've shared with six to ten people. 1% said that I've shared with... 11 to 15, and I guess those overachievers in the 3% bucket have shared with 16 plus people in the last 16 months. Those stats don't prove that we think that's the most important thing. Because if those 94 to 95% of Christians say that, those statistics don't prove that. So why? Why don't we share? I just threw up some fear of rejection, right? I feel like I'm going to get rejected. So I'm just not going to share. Let me help you with that when they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting They're rejecting God. They're not rejecting you. Our job is to walk in obedience and share. And let God deal with that. Fear of reception. What does that mean? I didn't get a whole lot of context around this one. But I, it might mean that what if this person does become a Christian? Then I got more responsibility to disciple them and share with them. Fear of representation is one of the ones that we're going to deal with a little bit more. I can't represent well. You know, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't communicate well. And then sometimes it's just apathy, right? Complacency. Um, again, we forget what God has done for us. We prejudge. Right? I know what they're going to say. They're going to say no. So I'm just not going to share. No. It's the walk of disobedience. But saying that I don't have anything to share, I don't know what to say, that's just Satan. Right? That's just Satan. Trying to keep you from sharing. You've got a ton of stuff to share. Let's talk about them real quickly. You guys aren't listening fast enough. Um, the first thing is my testimony. And we're going to talk about four different things that you're going to share. And, and, and depending on where you encounter somebody, you may share with them differently. And how are you going to know that? You've got to build a relationship. You have to build a relationship with non-Christian people. Shocker. If you're not around them, how are you going to share Right? If you're not around them, how are you going to be salt and light? You know, you've got to be around them. You've got to build a relationship and then you'll know. But one of the things I might consider, if, depending on where they are in their journey, not everything's going to resonate with them. My testimony. What is that? How I began a relationship with Christ and the difference He's made in my life. How I begin, how, you know, how'd you do that? First Peter 2 9 says, You're a chosen people, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you from darkness into His wonderful life. I like the paraphrases sometimes. The paraphrase for that, the message paraphrase says, You are chosen to do His work and speak for Him to tell others of the night and day difference He's made in your life. That's what he's wanting to do. In essence, you're witnessing. You're sharing what God has done in your life. You think about a witness in a courtroom, right? What's their responsibility? Just here to state the facts, man. Nothing but the facts. What has God done in my life? It's not our, it's not our job to argue a case. It's not our job to prove the truth. It's not our job to push for a verdict. 
The attorney does that in a courtroom. Our job is to be a witness, and guess who gets to guess who gets to argue the case in that person's life? Guess who gets to illuminate truth for them and for them to know what's true? And to and to convict and to press them for a decision. The Holy Spirit does. See, I just took the pressure off of us. You just gotta share. You just gotta open your mouth and share. You may not be a Bible scholar, it's okay. Right? Sometimes, you know, these type of stories in our own lives are much more effective. You know, I was laughing with, with Shannon yesterday. You know, pastors have a hard time sharing. They really do. Because why? Right? They're looked they're looked at as 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 professional salespeople. Fair? Guess what you and I are looked at as? Satisfied customers. Right? Not as much pressure when we share. You know, in your personal story, what God has done for you, it's a lot easier for people to relate to. You know, they're going to remember it longer. It's going to capture their attention. Stories build bridges that Jesus Christ can just walk right across. First Peter three fifteen says, "You got to be ready." We always have to be ready to give an answer to whoever asks you. But you've got to do it with gentleness and you've got to do it with respect. I'd write it down. That's the, you know, spend some time. It'll be good for you. If you're a Christian, write it down. What was my life like? How did I realize I needed him? How did I commit my life to him? What's the difference he's made? What else? So you can share your testimony. That's going to resonate with some people. You've got to share some life lessons, right? That's going to resonate with some people. Right? Because guess what? People are going through the same stuff you're going through. And they're looking for hope. They're looking for how to handle whatever they're going through in a good, healthy way. And again... Write it down. Write it down. What has God brought you through? What life lessons has God taught you about failure? What life lessons has He taught you about money, pain, waiting, illness, disappointment? Guess what, guys? Non Christians go through that too. The difference should be how we handle it. They should be able to look at our lives and they should be able to say, wow, there's something different about Mike. Because he didn't handle that the same way I would have. Or that I did. It gives you an opportunity. Aren't you glad that Solomon wrote down his life lessons? We got all the Proverbs and, Proverbs and Psalms. I mean Proverbs and Ecclesiastes to learn from. What else? Godly passions. We serve a passionate God. We serve a passionate God. He loves some things and He hates some things. And as we grow in our relationship with Him, He's going to give you a passion for something that He cares very deeply about. And that's going to resonate with some people. That's going to resonate with some people. Maybe it's a cause. Maybe it's a group of people. Business people. Teenagers. Kids. But there's something that you can share about the passions that God has given you. The good news. What is the good news? Mark 16, 15 says, Go everywhere and tell everybody about the good news. What is it? Romans 1 and 17 says, The good news shows how God makes people right with Him. It's as simple as that. It begins with faith, and it ends with faith. You've got some scriptures there um, that you can use to share. Um, 
and I'll mention some of those. And I was kidding with, wasn't kidding, I was actually serious, but I was talking to Shannon this morning that I thought I knew how I was going to talk through this piece of this, um, but I guy woke me up this morning at like 3.30 and he changed it twice since I got it. So we'll see what happens. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, guys, we've been talking about sharing your, your faith, your relationship with Jesus Christ, and I would be wrong if I assumed that everybody in here was in a relationship with Christ. That would be wrong of me to assume that. You may very well be. I don't know. I don't know where each and every one of you stand between you and God. Only you know that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share real quick just a simple way that you can talk to others about the good news. How can they become to get in a relationship with Christ? But if you don't know Him, listen to me with a different set of ears. Listen to me with a different set of ears that says... I'm not looking for something I can share. I'm looking for something I need. Because guess what, guys? We've been talking about sharing your faith and we can't share what we don't have. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, you can't share it. So I pulled out a bracelet. Many of you probably know. Tools are always great, guys. If you can use them. Um, tools are great. And this is just a... Victory Sports bracelet, but it tells a story. And you may or may not have your Bible with you when you need to share with somebody about Jesus Christ. So if you don't, have something like this. And always remember first and foremost that we're eternal beings. We're only here for a short amount of time. We're going to spend eternity somewhere. We're either going to spend eternity in heaven and for all of eternity with God. Or we're going to spend it separated from Him in a place called hell. Back to the song. God loves people more than anything. More than anything, He wanted you to know that He'd rather die than let you go and spend eternity separated from Him. So heaven is where we want to be, represented by the yellow. And there's, there's lots of ways you can try and get there. And most of the people that you talk to are probably going to be trying to work their way there. I'm going to do enough good works and I'm going to get there. And to those people, I would simply just try and find a pen... Or something that you can just hold up and say, hey, one end of this line rep represents 0% good. And this line, said, end of this line, represents 100% good. And I did this not long ago with somebody out at work. Just drew a line on the board. And I said, you put the dot where you think is enough. And most of the time, people are going to put it a little bit more than halfway. You know, if they want to hedge their bets, they might go to 60-75%. Most of them are going to put it about halfway. And I just looked at him and I said, what is wrong? What if he died? And God says, it wasn't 51, he was 72. What if he died and he says it was 52, not 51? Sorry, you don't make it. I don't know about you, but I don't want to take that chance. But the number is 100. I have to be 100% perfect. Because God is a holy God. And he can't have sin and imperfection around him. So I then move and just say, the dark on this represents sin. And the Bible says in, in Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned. 
everybody's messed up. We're born that way. You know, you look at that innocent little baby. No, they're not innocent. They're born into sin. And, and, and apart from a relationship, as they get old enough with God, they are, uh, they are objects of the wrath of God. I don't get that. You don't get that. That is what God's Word says. And we've already come to say in the first week of this that God's Word is our standard. And so the darkness represents the sin. And what does the Bible say in Romans 6.23? The payment, the wages for that sin is death, eternal separation from God. I'm sinful. I deserve eternal separation from God. There's got to be a payment. The people in the Old Testament knew that, right? They were sacrificing bulls and everything else. They knew there had to be a payment for their wrongdoing, right? But God finally said, enough. I'm only going to send one last payment. We're not going to do any more sacrifices. I'm making one last one. And all I need you to do, that's why it's so simple for people. It's so simple, but it gets so complex. I'm making one last sacrifice, guys. And all I ask you to do, like it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that He is God Himself coming, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. Not only did He come, but that God raised Him from the dead. Then you can be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself is a gift of God. Didn't say anything about what i got to do. Didn't say anything about how much I've got to work. It's a free gift that I've just got to accept. So the red represents that sacrifice. That last sacrifice that was made that Jesus Christ came. He was God Himself. He came. He died for you. And when I do just what Romans 10, 9, and 10 said, that if I believe that, I confess that with my mouth, I believe that with my heart, then I'm saved. Acts 20, 20, 26, 20 though says, Repent, Turn to God and turn to God. What does repentance mean? I'm going this direction and if I repent, I'm going that direction. I can't just say it. There has to be a change in my life. Not to earn that salvation, but because of what God did. The last part of that verse says, improve that difference by your deeds. Prove that difference by your deeds. And when I do that, guess what? When God looks at me, He doesn't see the darkness of sin anymore. He sees me white as snow. Because He looks right through the red blood of Jesus Christ, and He sees me white as snow. Pure and complete before Him, I made the 100. I got there. And once I've done that, once I've entered into that relationship with Him, I want to continue growing. That's the great. And you can remember that now. I need to go to God and pray. I need to read my Bible. I need to walk in obedience to Him. And I need to witness. It's just what we were talking about today. So we got a decision to make. And I'm just going to read. I don't know if I'm read, but I'm just going to read. Because um, I couldn't summarize this any better. Sometimes when you see something that's pretty good, don't try to improve on it. You got a choice. You're either going to be a world class Christian or you're going to be a world leader. It's your choice. Worldly Christians look to God primarily for personal fulfillment. They're saved, but they're self-centered. They love to attend concerts and enrichment seminars, but you never find them at a missions conference. They're just not interested. 
The prayers focused on how their needs, their blessings, and their happiness. It's a me first faith. How can God make my life more comfortable? They want to use God for their purposes instead of being used for His. In contrast, a world class Christian knows they're saved to serve, just like we talked about last week, and they're made for a mission. They're eager for a personal assignment and excited about the privilege of being used by God. World-class Christians are the only fully alive people. Their joy, their confidence, their enthusiasm is contagious because they know that they're making a difference. They wake up every morning expecting God to work through them in a fresh way. What type of Christian do you want to be? God invites us to participate in the greatest, the largest, the most diverse, and the most significant cause in history. His kingdom. So, anyone going to be in heaven because of you? Anyone in heaven going to be able to say thank you? I'm here because you cared enough to share. Imagine the joy of greeting people in heaven that you had the opportunity of helping to get there. Let's listen to this. Let's pray.